Dr. Ivana Stradner is a research fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, FTD, a nonpartisan institution focused on national security and foreign policy. She is a special correspondent at the Kiev Post and expert on Russia's information security. Ivana has been published in many academic journals and the media, including The Washington Post, Real Clear World and Defense, Newsweek, National Review, Foreign Policy, The National Interest, and many, many others. I also had the immense pleasure to uh, work with Ivana in December, uh, where we were uh, part of an event in Paris. Um, now, we can't uh, claim that we alone helped change France's foreign policy, but I like to think we had some uh, some small influence there because shortly after we were in Paris, uh, Macron seemed to uh, get a lot more determined to fight back against Russia. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but to start, thank you for uh, coming on Silicon Curtain. And for the audience, please like, subscribe, and definitely add a comment, because it really does help the videos perform in YouTube. Do also check out the validated Ukrainian charities that appear in the description of the video. It's incredibly important at this time that we help Ukrainians remain resilient. Ivana, welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for inviting me again, and uh, always pleasure to speak with you. Well, it was a fantastic conversation the first time. And of course, it was really when the channel was quite young and fresh at that point. We're now almost, uh, well, we're now in the third year of war. We're in the uh, second year of the channel's existence. And, um, you know, we, 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 we've got very serious about things like uh, Ukrainian victory. Uh, it's, it's absolutely critical that happens. And let's first start with the news this week. We saw... Putin in North Korea. We saw some extraordinary body language where he seemed to be in the submissive pose and uh, Kim Jong-un in, in the kind of more dominant pose, which is an extraordinary turnaround. Do you think Putin is desperate? And uh, does this trip give us some sort of signal that he might have realized he's in trouble? When I saw photos flowing around um, uh, Twitter uh, with Putin sitting in a, as you say, like a very submissive way. Uh, I was actually not surprised because his visit tells us all we need to know about his weakness. Um, he has been trying to create a multipolar world and that's the part of Russia's foreign policy and basically security strategy. And for that goal, he definitely needs China, Iran, and North Korea. But also, uh, Kim Jong-un, he perfectly understands that um, he can actually use Putin also as an asset. And for his, you know, own negotiations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, what we saw really uh, this, this week compared to a previous meeting with Kim Jong-un tells us a lot that actually uh, Putin's regime is not as strong as many people in the West uh, think. And that's a good news. Do you think as well, and I, I watched an interesting interview earlier today, and this idea really jumped out at me that, China, Xi Jinping, may be not absolutely delighted to see Putin turn up in North Korea. North Korea, even for China, is a bit of a wild card. It's uh, it's slightly scary and unpredictable. Do you think in some ways Putin is playing the nuclear card here as well? Not just going because he's dependent on North Korea, but telling the world and to an extent telling China, look at me, you know, I can I can be crazy. You've got to be scared of me. It's a it's another aspect of the whole nuclear blackmail that he likes to uh, throw out when he seems to be desperate. Putin actually has very little cards that can actually work. But there is one particular card that unfortunately still work with some in the West, including here in Washington, D.C., and that's nuclear blackmail. Um, he has used that card since the beginning of the war, but not only that, uh, the Kremlin has been using this card for, for decades. And nobody should be surprised because if you go back um, actually to the Cold War era, 
when Russia created the doctrine of reflexive control, where you basically feed your opponent with information that your opponent thinks that would benefit uh, uh, him or her, but actually benefits you. Um, <clears throat> that's the critical part for Russia's uh, uh, information operations uh, strategy. So I'll just give you a very concrete example. Um, here in Washington, D.C., one of the reasons why Washington was reluctant to uh, send all the weapons Ukraine need to win this war, it is in part because of fears of nuclear escalation. But Putin also understands something else. We should not forget that he is not a military guy. He's a KGB guy. He is an intel who likes to exploit uh, vulnerabilities of his opponents. And plausible deniability and deception is something that he is really, really, really good at. Two particular things that would benefit tremendously Kremlin is that if Iran develops nuclear weapons, as well as if North Korea is more uh, uh, willing to use nuclear blackmails, that would actually put in beliefs that would be a leverage that he can use against uh, the West. Because even though there are certain people still who believe in nuclear blackmail, there are less and less people in the West, including Macron, uh, who do not fear Putin's uh, nuclear arsenal. But if Putin claims uh, well, now you have Iran and North Korea to quite what he likes to call like irrational countries that can use blackmails. That will allow him to actually use that as a leverage and to position himself as a pillar of stability and telling the West, if you want peace, you have to negotiate with me and I will negotiate with North Korea and Iran. So we have to understand that game. That's the second part of the game that Putin um, has been uh, using to blackmail the West. And there's other elements as well in this blackmail, isn't there? Because we've known for some time, and I think we even discussed it on our, our first interview, but it, it seems my idea that just doesn't quite click with many people in the West who are, uh, you know, writing about foreign policy and so on, and they see it as this grand game of chess. I think Putin understands that things are far more fundamental than that. He understands that energy, that food, that migration, these are all things he can use to weaponize the political environment, for instance, in Europe. And if he injects money and disinformation narratives into the left and the right, and you know all sorts of oppositionist forces while creating uh, this this environment of threats and panic and fear and getting to people's you know fundamental needs food energy etc um he can uh, destabilize uh you know the alliance alliances that that seek to oppose him how do you see this working? Do you does he is he still able to play these cards? And are we being strategic enough in trying to counter his moves? Putin's jets and tanks are clearly not uh, powerful, but Russia has one of the most powerful weapons, which is information. And the more time I spend in the West, the more I realize that many people in the West are arrogant and they do not perceive this war through Putin's lenses. Um, through Putin's lenses, we have to perceive this war and in his view, winning this war is not going to be on the battlefield. This war is also about perception and about who is going to persevere. In other words, who is going to blink first? Putin also understands that the West has what I like to call ADHD when it comes to foreign policy. People get super bored after several days of, 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 of the news. Just look what's happening in Georgia. Um, uh, um, Georgia country, not Georgia, the state in the United States. I mean, 
uh, it's already not in the news as it used to be a few weeks ago. And the situation there should concern everyone in, 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 in Europe. So having said that, Putin understands that the best way that he can manage to win this war is to actually make sure that the West loses its mind. And Putin understands very well how to create chaos and how to create, um, polarize the West. Um, look, there are the elections in the, in, in the UK very soon. There were elections in the European Union and there are elections very soon also uh, in, in, in the US, along with countries such as Georgia or Moldova. And when there are elections, everyone is paying suddenly, you know, attention to Putin's information operations. When in fact, Russia has been waging information war 24-7, 365 days um, through also uh, hybrid warfare activities such as sabotage, but what you also mentioned by weaponizing migration, weaponizing religion, weaponizing uh, uh, energy sector, uh, uh, um, just filling the blank. And every vulnerability that exists, it's an opportunity for the Kremlin. So I'm very pleased to see that the West has sent more weapons and aid to Ukraine. But I'm also not very pleased to see how Russia perceives uh, this war, because this war, it is not about Ukraine only. This war has significantly greater strategic objectives for Russia. And while some in the West can laugh about Putin's decision to diminish and demolish a unipolar world led by the United States and create a multipolar world, we should actually take those things quite seriously. Um, because the very first fact, you know, that I'm sitting here in Washington, D.C., in, in a country that is superpower, um, that does not, you know, secure the future of American democracy and American-led uh, 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 world. Every time when I uh, um, mention that this war, it's also about challenging the international liberal order. I mean, that phrase has faded. But that's exactly what Russia has been trying to do with China, North Korea, and Iran. Just look at the United Nations. I mean, look, don't get me wrong, but the world does not revolve around Brussels, Washington, London. Um, there is also the Global South for the sake of, you know, for the lack of a better word, they have to use that term. And just look at the voting there. But not only that, look, we have to go back to the era of uh, Primakov doctrine that has been, you know, an important element in, 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 in geopolitics, basically how Russia uh, uh, perceives uh, uh, the creation of a multipolar world. And uh, even Primakov, he said that only political myopia can explain the readiness of some politicians in the West to write off Russia as a great power. And back then, if you look uh, at the analysis of coming from the Western analysts, you know, Russia, it's a nuclear state, like a third world, you know, like a country, et cetera. It's a mocking. Meanwhile, read Russia's national security strategies, whether related to cyberspace, because Russia understands very, very well that they do not need to roll on tanks and jets in any of those countries in the West. But using deception, which is tremendously critical component of how Russia is thinking, uh, we are not going to be able to understand truly what's going on there. And this is, you know, this is not that I'm trying, Jonathan, to uh, uh, raise some, you know, the alarm bell and to uh, have a doom and gloom scenario. Uh, but we also have to understand that even though that Russia and China, they're frenemies, they're cooperating in some areas, but also they're competing in others. They have a mutual enemy, which is 
the United States and the rest of the West. And they also need Iran and North Korea as useful idiots who are going to deliver certain, uh, uh, certain things. So unless we truly understand how Russia thinks, we are not going to be able to understand what's going on. And my last point to that is that Putin is thinking strategically about uh, uh, Ukraine and about security writ large. We are thinking tactically. Uh, Russia is trying to connect the dots. We are thinking that all those events are separate events. Look, um, there are certain parts of the world that I'm confident to say that I can talk with lots of confidence in terms of knowledge. There are parts of the world that I know very little. But I will tell you something that uh, even though I'm not an expert in Africa, oftentimes when I speak with people who are centering their analysis on Russia's efforts in Africa, the messaging and the tactics are very, very similar to actually what Russia has been using in places such as Georgia, Moldova, the Balkans, just filling the blank. And unless we can connect the dots and to understand the strategy behind those efforts, we are doomed to fail. We'll come back to this so-called axis of authoritarianism in a minute, because that's an absolutely fascinating question. But let's touch on an area of the world that you are, you know, very intimately familiar with. You have lots of uh, lots of fans there, I know. Um, and this is this is Serbia. Um, and of course, there are a number of countries which Russia does not outright control, but countries which have been known to reproduce Russian talking point. And if you look a little bit further, um, there are countries like Hungary, uh, Georgia is going through this at the moment, uh, and of course Serbia seems to have gone through it. And that is a democratic slide. That is where various institutions get degraded, rule of law gets degraded, and various informal networks, mafia networks, oligarch networks, um, other unseen processes uh, get their tentacles into society. Um, then you find opposition politicians get beaten, disappear, the press gets coerced. There's a whole bunch of techniques kind of going on. Uh, foreign agent laws seem to be part of it. There's a pattern here, which we've been labeling on this channel, the authoritarian toolkit. How does Russia export this? How does Russia utilize this to create allies? Because it can't invade everywhere. It's a lot cheaper to degrade a country to the point where it becomes compliant with your way of doing business. And that's what Russia seems to prefer when it can't degrade a country, it invades as we've seen in Ukraine. First of all, we have to ask ourselves a very important question, but an uncomfortable question, how it got to be this way. And before I analyze Russia, I also have to understand that in part, we are where we are because of the Western naivete. After the end of the Cold War, a lot of people in the West thought the democracy is going to prevail, that there are no external, basically no uh, threats minus uh, terrorism that happened specifically after September 11. Uh, but the West took democracy for granted. And they thought that open market economy and by investing in all those countries, um, 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 the market is going to help build a healthy society. Um, the West, particularly the United States, was occupied, understandably, you know, with its own problems back home. So the Western Balkans or a country such as Georgia or Moldova were not American priority. But then I also have to uh, 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 think about how Angela Merkel in particular also thought naively that um, economy um, and also uh, uh, tolerating the rise of authoritarian regimes there, but thinking that by tolerating them, they will be the ones who will be the pillars 
of stability and enabling like a cooperation that's going to fix a lot of things. Macron has changed drastically, but we should also not discard his actions in the past. And my point is we should never, ever, ever take democracy for granted. We are where we are because of that. Now, Russia enters. As I said, Putin is not a military guy. He's a KGB guy. He loves to exploit every vulnerability that is on the horizon. And he couldn't care less about promoting the rule of law. Um, for him, having actually authoritarian leaders and uh, countries that are prone to corruption would actually allow him to be able to um, use such leaders and such countries to destabilize the West. He does not need to invade countries such as Moldova or countries such as Georgia or any country in the Western Balkans. All he really needs to do is to keep frozen conflicts as they are and unfroze them when necessary to use his proxies to peddle his agenda in Europe, in Europe, just look, you have Hungary, you have Orban that has caused enough trouble in the European Union. No surprise why Hungary's number one country has been supporting Serbia to join the European Union because they need the axis of um, populist and authoritarian leaders there to destabilize the European Union even further. But here is the thing, bureaucracy everywhere uh, rewards risk aversion. And in order to fix that, you need to take certain uncomfortable steps. But we are thinking in terms of elections, you know, four years or two years, or it doesn't matter, you know, Russia is thinking strategically in the long run. They're not in a rush. They can accomplish their goals in 2024 or 2044. It doesn't matter. Because <laughs> Putin is thinking differently. And just to, to connect this thing, um, we are going to see elections this year also in Georgia. We are going to see elections in Moldova. Putin is already doing a lot of things to destabilize those regions. Um, uh, through information operations, cybersecurity efforts, energy efforts, just filling the blank. And to me, this particular law, foreign agent law, is something that we should definitely pay attention to because this is not only about some random law and that we should uh, help Georgia purely for idealistic reasons. No, we should help Georgia to advance our own national security. Because as I said, if Putin believes that this war is a war, democracy versus autocracy, we need to put him on the defensive. And the best way to destroy democracy is precisely through such laws. Because here is the thing, the United States, but also the European Union, they're doing everything possible not to rub the boat in case, you know, something escalates in Europe. And that's an opportunity, you know, for Putin, because what are we going to do? The law has passed. What are we going to do? Just think about this. Last year, 1990, 90 NATO peacekeepers were injured in clashes between Serb protesters and NATO peacekeepers in Kosovo. What did NATO do? Nothing. And for Putin using such tactics to show actually that the West is a paper tiger is a dream come true for Moscow. And that's why I'm very concerned when I see people in the West analyzing Putin's actions through their eyes, because this is one of the ugliest truth that I'm going to say. The West has forgotten how to speak to the Kremlin. 
but the Kremlin has actually mastered to read Western mind. And there's the coercive manipulation that you mentioned earlier. And unfortunately, the media environment, which you also mentioned, um, is really not geared up anymore to handle geopolitics in a strong or even nuanced fashion. Um, areas where Russia's influence is also, you know, extremely strong is the Middle East. Syria, the absolute sort of uh, well of misery, chaos and violence, Russia to a large extent has, has got its claws in there and is able to destabilize the Middle East. Africa barely gets a mention, and yet there have been multiple insurrections in the Sahel, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Wagner, again, has its tentacles into so many African countries in that region. At the moment, it's insurrection, but we've seen in Ukraine the breakdown of the post-Second World War order, which is fundamentally built on sovereign borders. There is, of course, a risk that Russia will start to export that as well and further erode the international order by working in continents like Africa uh, to start introducing border changes, uh, disruptions of sovereign borders, and, and things really could, could go from bad to worse. Very little is spoken about this. So, as I said, Putin is thinking strategically. We are thinking, you know, tactically. Um, the West has left Africa to Russia and China. And just look how Putin has humiliated France in Africa. Putin needs Africa for various different reasons, but in large part because of um, 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 uh, natural resources, uh, but also because uh, Africa is an important continent for his ideological uh, um, goal to create a multipolar world. And he needs actually Western, uh, um, he needs those allies uh, to accomplish those goals. It's not only Africa, just look at what's happening in uh, Latin America um, and how, you know, his proxies also operate there. So it's literally everywhere. I mean, just look what's happening also in the Middle East and his support for uh, uh, his support of, of Iran. I mean, how he has leveraged the whole thing, you know, related to Hamas and to use and to portray um, the war as Western weakness. Um, also, I recently actually analyzed something really interesting, how he has used even anti-colonial narratives, which is part of Putin's information warfare um, uh, messaging, also related to, to Hamas, basically claiming, you know, that it's Russia that is anti-colonial um, 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 uh, country, you know, that they're helping. Uh, it's funny because around this time, around the elections, they're using very similar narratives also in the United Kingdom to polarize, you know, the UK. So we know the script. We know exactly how Russia operates. As I told you, I'm not an expert in Africa, but every time when I speak with my colleagues who are analyzing Russia's efforts there, I'm like, this is exactly what Russia is doing in Georgia or Moldova or the Balkans. Like it's it's a very, very similar script. You know, the messaging is, uh, the key messaging is always, you know, the same, but they also understand cultural nuances and how to exploit them. Uh, so, Unfortunately, until we start thinking about uh, the world politics through Putin's lenses, it will be very, very difficult for um, clearly not all, but some um, analysts to understand how we can how we can prevail this time. And it's tricky, isn't it? Because after the Western failures in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan, where there's an attempt to introduce uh you know western plurality and values and democracy and so on and you know fundamentally that 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 didn't go quite according to plan and uh a lot in the west have said okay well this sort of you know this this system building is is not something we're good at we shouldn't try it etc we we're not going to impose our values 
you know, we're not going to try to impose democracy or export democracy into other places. But it seems that if the authoritarians have a highly effective toolkit for the export of autocracy, we need to develop a toolkit for democracy. And we need to get rather aggressive about helping people and exporting and sharing those ideas. Democracy promotion, it's not an idealism. It actually benefits American national security. You mentioned two examples um, and it is okay, you know, that countries sometimes do not accomplish, you know, their goals, but it doesn't mean that because of um, some limitations that we had in the past that we should just stop doing that and adopting the strategy also of supporting um, what we call like a benevolent dictators, those dictators that can actually in the short run benefit Western um, security because they will not. Um, supporting authoritarian regimes failed in the past and it will fail again. But this time with Russia, China, North Korea and Iran, it will be very costly. Because one thing is that you can play those games when you have a unipolar system and to some extent to, ex to control the situation. This time it's a little bit different. Second thing, um, another a very, very important uh, uh, point when it comes to uh, democracy promotion is that um, we need to also understand that it's much easier to destroy something than to build. And that's why Russia has been very successful uh, in information warfare, because they do not need to promote ideas to build ideas. All they really need to do is to destroy. The only game that we can play right now is the game in the long run, which is a two-part game. The first part, we need to neutralize Russia. And then, and only then, we can build. Because as I said earlier today, we failed after the end of the Cold War to recognize that we should never, ever take democracy for granted. And unfortunately, nowadays, just look at various different democracy uh, um, um, data, how actually authoritarian regimes um, are in some places thriving. And in those places, you cannot sell Western dream. Instead, the first thing what you need to do is to play those games by neutralizing Russia and telling those countries that actually countries such as Russia and China, that they are not friends, that they are not allies, that they will throw them under the bus. Just look what happened in, in Armenia. Putin literally, through, its, uh, through his ally Armenia under the bus when Armenia asked for help. Uh, with its war uh, with, with Azerbaijan related to Nagorno-Karabakh, what they put into nothing. And they had an obligation under the CSTO. So while NATO is growing, the CSTO is fall, falling apart. What I like to call while Western NATO is growing, Russia's mini NATO is falling apart. And that's a great opportunity to use the truth to communicate that actually with friends like Putin, you don't need enemies. And, and only- mm -hmm. Sorry. Long run, no, and only then in the long run, we can go back to um, our post-Cold War era, um, thinking about you know, how we can promote uh, our values, the rule of law, and as I said, it's not because um, we are idealistic, but rather because we are very realistic and that benefits our national security as well. Well, the last area to focus on, because I know it's uh, it's late and uh, you've had quite an intense week, um, but there's some interesting articles out and you mention 
almost the economics of Russian information warfare. So it's far less costly. It uses far less resources um, to destroy an idea, to destroy cohesion than it does to build something or convince people of something or even take action. Another technique of Russian propaganda is to flood the environment with false information and to create, in some instances, a false equivalent between two things that are actually quite different. Unfortunately, in this instance, we see, you know, not just trolls and bots repeating this, we see actually quite a few foreign policy commentators, journalists, politicians, who quite readily pick up on these kind of narratives, this false equivalence technique, and they manage to wrap it up into, you know, sophisticated language. But essentially, it's a form of inaction, a form of appeasement uh, that they justify sometimes in quite sophisticated ways. But ultimately, it's clear in the ground for those who have the will to step in. One could even say sort of commit evil in a vacuum, um, like Russia, to do that. Um, there's a fascinating article by Stephen M. Walt. I'm sure you've, you've heard of him. And the title of this article is literally In Defense of Appeasement. And there's lots of this sort of strange false equivalence and historical examples that don't quite stack up. Um, why do you think it is that narratives that are favorable to the Kremlin seem to get picked up? And it's not just by people who are assets and agents. Um, it, it seems to be picked up in all sorts of spheres and then sort of amplified. I think it's a very, very generic question, given, you know, that I think it's better if we uh, answer that question case by case uh, basis, which would take us like who knows how many weeks. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it has always existed like that. Just go back to the Cold War era. And even back then, you had propagandists uh, in the West, including in the United States, that were openly supporting um, uh, the communism of so the Soviet Union. The only difference nowadays that such flow information can um, uh, can actually uh, uh, flow much faster due to um, social media. You know, is there a motivation? I don't know. Some of them are probably ideologically driven. Some of them are money driven. Um, some of them are driven for various different reasons. I don't know. Uh, but I do want to emphasize one other thing, which you mentioned, you know, appeasement. Um, one thing that we need to understand is that for the Kremlin, kindness is weakness and weakness emboldens them. And the only way that we can truly win this war is if we show actually strength and unity. And that's why I'm tremendously grateful and happy to see that NATO actually published recently a warning about Russia's hybrid warfare activities, warning that this war is a much more complex war than a lot of people actually think. What you have noticed recently related to sabotage incidents across Europe, um, whether, you know, influence operations, whether cyber activities, uh, filling the blank, uh, that's how Russia operates. And the sooner we admit that we are in a hybrid war against Russia, uh, the sooner we are actually going to put our act together and um, try to do everything possible actually um, uh, to put Russia on the defensive because it's truly high time to do that. They've had us on the defensive, haven't they, for most of the last uh, two years of full-scale war. Escalation management is something that's been talked about a lot on many channels. It's something people became really aware of, I think, towards the end of, of last year, and then started to associate names like Jake Sullivan with this policy of escalation management. Finally, it seems that policy is starting to be shed. There is some slow realisation the escalation management has not limited Russia's aggression, but as you say, has emboldened its aggression. 
Indeed, as I said, uh, for Putin, weakness is something that emboldens him. He cannot stand weakness. And it's also, you know, the part of culture too. And um, the sooner we understand that, the better. That whole point about escalation management, I told you with nuclear threats, that was a perfect explanation of how the Kremlin actually operates. Because they understand in some Western minds, um, um, they remember the Cold War. And they think immediately with nuclear Armageddon. But here is the thing. If Putin decides to use nuclear weapons, nothing will stop him. His decision will not be made based on our uh, uh, willingness and capabilities to send weapons to, to Ukraine. Instead, he is going to use that, you know, for any different reason. And that's why we should pay attention to Putin's also uh, uh, connections with North Korea and Iran, because what he will try definitely to do is to use his proxies for further destabilization of uh, of the West. That's a very good point. It's a point that Yuri Fejtinsky made uh, last year on the channel about Belarus as well, this idea that they will manipulate proxies uh, to muddy the waters, make it difficult for you know, NATO and the Western allies to respond or even to understand, you know, who's pulling the strings. Ivana, fantastic <laughs> insights. Yeah. Just give... one, one quick, you know, note. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about how Putin can actually challenge NATO, it can always be, you know, just below the threshold of war, but powerful enough to actually destroy the unity of NATO. It's terrifying and highly believable unfortunately um and uh we perhaps even now are not doing the planning uh and the thinking that uh, would prevent such a such a thing happening ivana i encourage people to read your writings uh to follow you especially on twitter and all the other platforms or x as it's now called your insights are always ahead of the curve and always absolutely essential reading Thank you so much for coming up to Silicon Curtain again, and I hope to have that pleasure again in future. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm very pleased to see that your channel is growing with wonderful guests. Uh, but I truly hope that uh, next time when you invite me to speak with you, um, I will have analysis that is not, you know, as dark as, as today and that we can actually talk about um, um, uh, about some um, more optimistic topics, including, you know, on how finally to build democracy across the world.